of the Canadian Public Health Association, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, webinar entitled Connect. Um, Sorry, connecting the dots to re reduce radon risk. I really should have my notes right in front of me before I start these things. Um, very pleased to be uh, hosting today's uh, webinar in uh, collaboration with Health Canada's National Radon Program. I uh, want to begin by acknowledging that CPHA's offices are located on the ancestral and unceded territorial territory of the Anishinaabeg and um, uh, people and uh, CPHA is committed uh, to meaningful and long-term uh, reconciliation with all of Canada's First Peoples. Uh, before we get started, just want to remind people that if you have questions for today, uh, for our presenters today, to, uh, to please post those using the Q&A module uh, on Zoom across the at the bottom of your screen. Uh, today's session is being recorded and will be available on CPHA's YouTube channel uh, in a couple of days. Uh, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to uh, present to you uh, today's, or introduce to you today's uh, presenters. First is Sandy Hutchison, who is a regional radiations, uh, radiation specialist with Health Canada. Uh, Anne-Marie Nicol is uh, an environmental health knowledge translation scientist at the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health and also a, uh, an associate professor in health sciences at Simon Fraser University and Jill Hubick, a manager of community and patient engagement at the Lung Association of Saskatchewan. So welcome to all of our presenters today and the floor is yours. Thank you Ian and thank you everyone for joining us and for your interest in radon. Uh, it is a incredibly interesting topic and today we're very lucky to have some of the most enthusiastic uh, stakeholders uh, from Canada to share a lot with you about connecting the dots to reduce radon risk. And uh, if you get what I'm going with lowly here, there are a lot of dots to connect. 86 protons uh, in radon, uh, in fact, and uh, we represent maybe a couple of those dots, but we'd love to have you on board as well as public health professionals. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done. We're gonna talk about that today, but there's still plenty to be done, so. Also want to mention uh, that all of us are active in the collaborative effort uh, called Take Action on Radon. Anne-Marie is uh, a member of the National Advisory Team. Jill chairs a provincial coalition in Saskatchewan. And myself as a Health Canada employee, I'm a regular contributor at both the national and regional levels to that. So uh, this has been a fantastic initiative uh, that has brought many people together, uh, i.e. connecting the dots. And I hope after today, uh, we can count on you uh, maybe to find uh, a role uh, and uh, help us further connect the dots. So over to you, Jill. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna first start by sharing with you what radon is. And radon is a radioactive gas that comes from the breakdown of uranium and it's in our soil and in our rock and Certainly in Canada, we have a lot of uranium. So we also have, unfortunately, have a lot of radon. And what makes radon really unique is you cannot detect it with the human senses. You can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it. Um, so having said that, how do we know it's there? And we know that there's a lot of uranium and we know that radon is in enclosed spaces, okay? So it's found in all indoor spaces, homes, our workplace, or school, and we don't worry about it outside, but we worry about high levels in enclosed spaces. So the only way, if you can't see, taste, or smell it, to know how much radon is there is to, in fact, test for radon. Next slide, please. So why do we worry about radon? If there's a lot of it out there, we can't see it, we can't taste it, we can't smell it, why are we worried about it? Well, because radon uh, can cause lung cancer. And when radon breaks down, it actually uh, forms radioactive particles that we can inhale into our lungs. And when it, those particles are in our lungs, they emit an energy which can damage the lung tissues. And our bodies are brilliant at trying to heal themselves when a cell is damaged, when DNA strands are damaged, they try and put those strands and those cells back together properly. But every now and then, our bodies get it wrong and there's a mutation 
And with that, um, there's a risk when there's mutation, that's when we see the lung cancer. And in 2012, Health Canada did a survey and they showed that 7% of Canadian homes have in fact high levels of radon. So there's a lot of Canadians at risk for developing lung cancer. Next slide, please. So we know that radon is a known carcinogen. We know that it causes cancer. In fact, it's the number one cause of lung cancer in people that do not smoke. The second leading cause of lung cancer in in overall. And we know that the more radon we're exposed to, the longer we're exposed to those high levels, the greater the risk is of developing lung cancer. And Health Canada has said, there is no safe level of radon. We know that. We want to encourage everyone to lower their radon levels and their exposure to as low as they they can as long as low as they possibly can but they've set an action guideline and said you know what anyone over 200 becquerels that's getting high and we want you to bring those radon levels down and take action next slide please so we know that the number one cause of lung cancer is from smoking and number two is from radon so what happens when people have high levels of radon we uh, this is 800 becquerels or, and they smoke, so you put the two together. Well, here's some, here's some facts for you. If you look at people that are exposed to high levels of radon, one in 20 who don't smoke, but have high levels of radon over a lifetime of 800 becquerels will, will in fact die of lung cancer. Whereas you look at people who smoke and have high levels of radon, their risk goes up significantly one in three and we so we're saying you know what that lifetime um excess cancer risk is just too high for us from a public health perspective next slide please and lung cancer is a public health concern um it is the leading cause of lung cancer death in both men and women uh, it, it putting that a little bit more into perspective it kills more people than breast colon and prostate cancers combined and unfortunately with lung cancer, compared to a lot of other diseases in lung cancer, when we start to see symptoms of lung cancer, sadly the disease is at an advanced stage and it's very difficult to treat. We know, uh, you know, the five year survival rate for lung cancer in men and women is around, you know, 15 to 20%. Um, it's not good. But um, the other piece that is an added challenge for us with radon is, exposure to high levels won't show signs and symptoms in the body right away. And what I'm referring to when I speak of that is if you think about carbon monoxide, if those carbon monoxide levels were to rise and become high and one was exposed to it, we would start to feel ill, we, you know, a headache, fatigue, sick to our stomachs, we would know something's wrong. That's not the case with, with radon. And unfortunately, if there are signs and symptoms, that's an indication more so of an advanced stage of lung cancer. Next slide, please. And we were talking about where is, where is radon? Well, we said it's in all indoor spaces. We don't worry about it outside when it's dispersed, but we worry about radon in enclosed spaces. And Canadians spend a lot of time in, indoors. We live in a colder climate, and also a lot of our work um, is indoors. So a study, uh, studies have shown that about 90% of our time is indoors. That's a lot of time. And we as a society are becoming much more energy efficient, making our homes more airtight, which is great in many ways, but maybe not so much in the case of radon because we're taking that radon gas and we're trapping it in our homes. With the current COVID-19 pandemic, we are telling everyone to stay home as much as possible. So he, Canadians and the world are spending more time than ever at home. So my point with that is that now, more so than ever, we always say it's a great time to test, but now is the best time to test for radon and the best time to reduce your radon levels. Next slide, please. So many symptoms of lung cancer, I, I, I talked about how advanced stage of lung cancer um, it's often when we see the symptoms. And if you look at those symptoms, when someone has a cough or if they have fatigue or they have shortness of breath, we don't usually think right away, oh, it must be lung cancer. Cough, for example, can be so many things. A cough could be a cold. A cough could be asthma. A cough could be COPD. 
today, we often think a cough, oh my goodness, our first thought is, is it COVID? Shortness of breath, that could be a cardiac disease. That could be a new, any number of respiratory disease. Fatigue, well, that opens up the spectrum even more, but also all these symptoms we think of COVID-19 and that's something that we fear. And I bring this up because there has been reports out of the UK showing that lung cancer screening has decreased by, uh, because of the pandemic by about 50%. The World Health Organization put out a report recently and they said, you know, the, the pandemic has had an impact on our health services and disrupt, disrupted specifically cancer treatments by 42%. And I am very fortunate enough to speak a lot with our respirology team in, in Saskatchewan. And anecdotally, they have said, by the time patients are coming to them much later, by the time they're seeing patients, they're, they're very sick. Their symptoms are very severe. And it's all out of a fear of COVID-19. So again, COVID has impacted the amount of time we spend at home. We're spending more and we're not necessarily receiving the same services and, and in this timely fashion as well as um, we're seeking help later. Next slide. So when you look at mass screening for lung cancer, because we know when we catch the disease later, it's much harder to treat. So we try and catch it early. And if you look at the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Healthcare, their criteria broadly looks at people that are 50 to 74 years of age. So they're older. There are people that still smoke or have smoked in the past and have smoked a 30 pack year history. So what that means if you smoke, for example, um, two packs a day for 15 years, that would be equivalent of a 30 pack year history. And this criteria largely comes from a large trial that came out of the US, the National Screening Trial. It's the kind of the most famous to date. And they, they looked at this group in particular, and they had over 50,000 participants and they divided it in two and they had half the participants receive x-rays, half really half receive a low dose CT. The trial was significant in that they found that those that received the low dose CT did in fact reduce their risk of mortality um, close to about 7%. However, the low dose CT scans found a lot of nodules, but they weren't cancerous. So there was a lot of false positives that happened. As a result, surgeons and, and clinicians were having to do more testing, whether it be scopes or um, biopsies, which was costly, which took a lot of um, human resources. And then there was also uh, complications from those, you know, collapse, lungs, even death in some of these cases. And the false positives were really high. So since then, there's been other trials where they've looked at things like age, more, or in addition to age, they've looked at race, body mass index, smoking, and as well looked at things like uh, a first degree relative that had in fact had lung cancer um, to help narrow down and pinpoint who we should be screening more specifically. And they did find that the false positives were less in those scenarios. So that was great. But in none of these uh, trials and criteria have they looked at identifying radon as a risk factor, even though it's the second leading cause of lung cancer. Uh, next slide, please. So I don't have an answer for you, but I'm gonna give a little scenario here and just some food for thought. So what if there was a female, 47 years old, so they're not quite in that age bracket that we talked about with criteria, but they're getting closer to that. They've never smoked. They have no known respiratory diagnosis and they currently have no signs and symptoms typical of lung cancer. But they've been exposed to an incredibly high number of radon, uh, high level of radon. So remember that 200 is that action mark. We're over 2000 here. And they've lived in that house for over 17 years. What would you do? Would you do anything? If yes, what's your rationale? If no, what's your rationale? Would, would you need to see symptoms first? Would, would you screen for a CT scan? And the question posing to you guys is, should targeted screening criteria include radon? Should it be explored? Next slide, please. Well, there's, there's two sides to this, and, and this could be probably a presentation all in itself and a debate. 
But when it comes to people who smoke, we don't rely primarily on prevention measures to reduce um, our lung cancer uh, risk. We do do mass screening. We do have the technology and should cost effectiveness rule out um, possibly saving lives? Or do we rely on, you know, more so the preventative side? Uh, we know that exposure um, history to radon is so hard to track. How many homes have you lived in? Do you know what their radon levels uh, were? And radon testing rates, although they're on the rise, they're still quite low, uh, sadly, in, the, in our country. And, and currently, we have a lot of people that still need to reduce their radon um, in their homes when their levels are high. That's quite low as well. Um, perhaps we should consider looking at radon in our lung cancer screening, or perhaps we need to learn more about mass screening and learn more about radon uh, uh, in, order, in order to answer this. So it's some food for thought. Next slide, please. We do know, however, that radon poses a significant risk to all Canadians' lung health. And that's why we're so glad you're here today uh, joining us and learning about this, because we know that decreasing the risk of lung cancer really will have a positive impact on public health. And while lung cancer screening is, is great and early detection, but early detection and treatment really does remain a challenge, we know that lung cancer can be prevented, uh, especially lung cancer from radon. We want everyone to test their homes for radon. We want everyone to test their workplaces for radon. And if those levels are high, we want people to bring those levels down. So public health professionals have a key role. You guys have a key role to play in developing policies and programs to reduce the burden of radon-induced lung cancer. And, and we hope we can get you on board and joining our radon team. Uh, now I'll pass it over to Sandy to talk about how you can reduce radon and some of the initiatives he and the team have been part of to help uh, lower our radon risk and as well bring awareness to Canadians. Thank you, Jill. Uh, fantastic to hear from uh, a health professional's perspective, uh, you know, where we could go potentially, and uh, I hope we can start those conversations. Um, a good point, or a good time to point out that we do know how uh, to reduce radon levels uh, in an indoor environment. Uh, it looks uh, incredibly simple on the surface. Some people think uh, it's uh, easy enough to do themselves. Um, if you've ever seen the system, it might just look like a chunk of pipe and a fan. Uh, I assure you there's a little bit more thought and planning that goes into it uh, to make sure it's a safe and effective system. But at the end of the day, yeah, uh, you're going to provide a bypass right on to get from beneath your home where it's building up uh, in a pressurized environment and giving it a uh, easier pathway to atmosphere as opposed to going through your home where it can accumulate. So a couple of key areas uh, that you need to consider is the suction point where that is going to occur uh, in the footprint of the home. And the subslab material will also impact uh, which fan you choose, uh, which, uh, how large a suction pit you need. Uh, and because you keep in mind, you don't want to just throw the big fan in there and uh, and end up sucking all the conditioned air that you've just paid to heat or cool. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a science to this and uh, it has to be done right. But it absolutely can be uh, done in almost every building. So next slide, please. Ian. I'll take it way back. Uh, when I started at Health Canada, uh, I didn't know the actual radon, to be honest. Uh, but uh, it all started with the Gazette and the Minister of Health uh, recommending that no Canadian should be exposed to levels of radon above 200 becquerels per cubic meter. And from there, we have just really exploded uh, and, and filled a lot of gaps in terms of testing protocols, uh, whether it's uh, recommendations for a home setting or a public building. Uh, schools are a little bit different because of their varied occupancy. Um, 
we have experience now in testing almost every uh, environment, uh, and you'll find that in our protocols. There's a certification program. Uh, we start by piggybacking on our uh, neighbors to the south. We now have a very Canadian program uh, using our units and uh, taking into consideration our climate and our quality assurance and controls. The National Building Code also took steps forward uh, back in 2010, and that has been adopted by uh, various provinces since then uh, to include rough-in stage uh, mitigation. So no protection yet, but uh, you're a few steps closer. Uh, so once the occupants have moved in, uh, and take the initiative to test, they have already a pipe that is laid beneath the uh, foundation and roughed in, similar to plumbing, but not at all like plumbing, because it's just open beneath your home. Don't confuse them. Uh, uh, hence, it should be capped and labeled and ready for future use. Um, so that was, that was an important step forward, but we're not done yet. Uh, we've uh, gone one step further with Canadian General Standards Board and really laying out uh, the specific requirements uh, of, of labeling of the pipes to use uh, and fans uh, so that we can ensure that we're doing this safely. Next slide, please. Paper, wow, and electronic copies of publications. You name them, we got them. Uh, there's copies for the general public. Uh, there's copies uh, specific to health professionals, to the real estate industry. Uh, in the middle, you'll see one of those things is not quite like the others. We used to have uh, a partnership with uh, the CMHC, the Mortgage Housing Corporation. Uh, if you click again, please, Ian, you'll see that that has been updated. Uh, so we now have our, our volume of all the best rate on information uh, for Canadians called the Reduction Guide. Um, definitely worth a read. Please feel free to access uh, all of these online and uh, get in touch if you'd like some copies. I'd like to point out the uh, item on the right there. Uh, we call that uh, postcard. So back in January, about one and a half million copies of those were sent out uh, as unaddressed mail. And I sometimes just call that junk mail. You wouldn't believe the impact that that had. Um, I got calls nonstop for days and, uh, and uh, perhaps our team in Ottawa is chuckling at me because maybe I was the only one that time, but we're in round two now. Another 1.6 million of those postcards are currently being sent home across the country uh, to raid on rich areas. So that means that we're going to reach an entire neighborhood and, you know, for anybody who lives in a neighborhood that has a, a WhatsApp chat group or uh, if uh, there's still any coffee uh, chat going on, uh, it, it came up as a topic a lot and that really propelled us for uh, winter. So you never know what it's going to be uh, and what form your pocket is going to happen, but uh, we, have, we have options. Next slide, please. Sandy, just before we move on, you may want to turn off your uh, video just to improve your sound quality. Done. Thank you, Ian. What else have we done? Uh, trade shows, uh, a lot of them. Uh, many hours spent on my feet uh, talking about radon. It was slow 12 years ago, but I can tell you now I, uh, we're in demand at some trade shows. Of course, things have changed in the last seven months and my feet are a lot better rested but uh, still the opportunity to do these things virtually, attending conferences, putting on presentations or public information sessions have all been valuable uh, outreach tools in our disposal. We had quite a bit of attention in the media, uh, relatively speaking. I think we've done very well over the years considering it has been primarily uh, earned media um, and particularly during Great on Action Month in November, we always seem to get a fair uh, shape in the media. I don't know how many of you are familiar. If you could name a, uh, a Radon spokesperson uh, of our pat in the past, uh, it means you've been paying attention. Uh, Dr. Roberta Bondar, 
Mike Holmes, Mike Holmes Jr. have all been uh, on our side when it comes to uh, radon in the media. And uh, a credit to them all for, for helping us spread the message. Uh, but that one little piece of junk mail is still blew on the water. <laughs> Next slide, please. Regional and national campaigns have been uh, fantastic and they take a lot of time and energy, but it really does uh, show uh, that it, that can pay off. Um, everything from proclamations of Raid on Action Month, uh, in uh, even whether it's province wide, such as Saskatchewan, some major cities uh, have also proclaimed Raid on Action Month. Those are big steps. Um, we have a citizen science style projects such as Evict Radon uh, that in really make the uh, people feel involved and that their uh, radon levels are going to help uh, feed research and make a difference in people's lives. Tackle Radon is uh, is not a hundred percent fun, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, we have Canadian Football League uh, ambassadors uh, in a friendly competition. Uh, right now, it's just Manitoba versus Saskatchewan. And if anybody knows Bombers versus Riders, that's a big deal. Manitoba happens to be doing really well. Uh, this just launched uh, last week, uh, all thanks to Jill and her team at the Saskatchewan Lung Association and the Manitoba Lung Association participating as well. It's, it's a great initiative that brings a little bit of a lighter side and uh, some real down to stories from our ambassadors. Uh, they didn't know much about radon uh, two years ago. Now they realize how important it is to get the message out and that seems to be resonating. The 100 Best Kit Challenge is another uh, initiative uh, that has had a great impact. I'm going to let Anne-Marie talk more about that, uh, but as you can imagine, when people don't feel like they're the only one uh, testing, uh, it becomes just a little less uh, uh, scary, I guess. Uh, your neighbors or your entire community being involved really does seem to, to help. Next slide, please. a uh, wide range and I certainly have mentioned them all. Uh, I am just one uh, regional radiation specialist. There's five more across the country and a whole team in Ottawa that have been working on initiatives uh, for years. Uh, I want to point out a couple of different things. Uh, in Ontario, for example, uh, you can get radon mitigation covered through home warranty uh, within seven years. That's a fantastic program. Nowhere else in the country is there such a widespread uh, warranty program like that. In Manitoba, uh, the power utility uh, does have a financing plan that will allow you to uh, include uh, radon mitigation on a five-year uh, financing plan. Again, it's an it's an option uh, that's nice to have and actually taken at a uh, province-wide level. Build it down to a municipal uh, area that is taking big steps. Victoria, Quebec. They will give you a rebate if you test for radon, and another rebate if you end up mitigating. All part of an initiative to uh, uh, help their citizens uh, be healthier and uh, their homes to be safer. In Nova Scotia, uh, the Real Estate Commission uh, decided that a radon course uh, will be mandatory to raise awareness amongst uh, their professionals. A uh, fantastic step uh, to build that knowledge base. Um, Real estate is a tricky one. Uh, a lot of people will quickly Google and find that in the States you have to do a radon test uh, in order to sell your home. Because we believe in long-term testing here in Canada, uh, a 91-day test, that's not as easy to work into the real estate process, but there is certainly guidance around that uh, if, if you choose to do so. But having the realtors educated has been a very important step. And the last one I'd like to mention here is uh, a professional development uh, course that's available to you uh, and uh, for credit, in fact, through McMaster University. Uh, the link there, uh, shown in the image, radon.machealth.ca, will give you the basics uh, of what radon is, uh, what you need to know and, and share with patients, if you're seeing patients, and ways to, uh, to build 
uh, that awareness. So I encourage you to, uh, to check that out and take credit for it uh, if you'd like to do so. I think the next slide belongs to Anne Marie. Uh, if you didn't see yourself in uh, any of those uh, uh, silos or, or zones, I encourage you to uh, to to reach out to us. There's plenty of other ideas, uh, plenty of other ways to get involved, uh, and Anne Marie is going to talk about a few more. Uh, yeah, so please enjoy. Thanks, Sandy. Um, I'm going to turn my video off, but I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the traditional Coast Salish lands here in British Columbia, and I am indeed representing Simon Fraser University, which is in Burnaby. I'll turn my video off now to conserve my bandwidth. So I'm going to talk today a bit more specifically about what public health can do in my role as a knowledge translation scientist at the National Collaborating Centre for Environmental Health. I spend a great deal of time working with public health stakeholders trying to promote radon awareness. And at Simon Fraser University, I am the co-investigator of the CAREX Canada program which looks at carcinogen surveillance across the country. And this is funded in part by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. And what this project has done is allowed us to identify radon as one of the most significant carcinogens you would encounter in Canada in your indoor environment. And as a result, over the last five years, we've started programs to really engage public health in particular to figure out what it is that we can do to move the dial on getting people to test for radon. Next slide, please. So one of the first things that, that we've realized is that while the federal government has done a significant amount and what Sandy has been speaking to predominantly is the amount of work that's been done by the radon program the federal government offers since about 2007. So there's a great deal of resources and guidance and information for people, but it's not necessarily translating into the provincial jurisdiction where we know that public health is the purview of provincial governments. And in some cases, we have seen uh, initiatives, particularly in Ontario, which has included radon in the work that public health units can do. And over the last few years, I'd just like to point to some of these public health spaces in Ontario that we feel have done a really great job of adopting radon and radon programming. So each one of these regions has online resources. Um, and if your public health unit is interested in adopting Radon right programming, I strongly encourage you to reach out and see what these different groups are doing. Public health has a role to play and we believe that much more could be done across the country. Next slide, please. So at CAREX Canada, we are looking particularly at radon policy and we went across the country to figure out what's happening in schools. And reducing radon we know is important in all places where people spend more than four hours. And for young children, this includes both schools and childcare facilities. And I'll speak to childcare in the next slide. But not only do children spend time in schools, but they often spend time in aftercare or before school care. So at least four to six hours are spent indoors often by most children across the country. And we know that these facilities are often ground contact or basement classrooms. We don't usually have super high rise uh, schools in Canada. Uh, and then again, we have early and after school care programs. So if we reduce exposures for children particularly, we know that this reduces the overall lifetime exposure to alpha radiation and reduces the risk of lung cancer. And so when we decided to look for policies in schools, what we found is that it was quite patchy across the country. And so far, only Saskatchewan and some of the maritime provinces, and then more recently the Yukon, have actually adopted programs where they ensure that schools are tested. So there's a lot more that can be done, particularly in the more populated regions of the country, to improve the number of schools that are both tested and then mitigated for radon. And we believe that stronger policy action at the provincial level will really make this come about. Next slide, please. So the Take Action on Radon actually has developed some resources for people to work with schools. And we have found instances where public health has got involved working with school districts um, and helping to talk to parents about the importance of school, helping school districts navigate mitigation. Often they need connections to people within the industry and they turn for expertise in public health. 
So we believe that public health professionals really can play a role both in introducing the concepts to people in schools and school districts, and then helping to find some creative approaches that initiate testing. In some cases, environmental health officers have helped um, actual facilities managers learn about radon and to bring radon programming into schools for school specific education. Um, and as a result, this school tool school kit, school toolkit, sorry, I'm tripping over my words. Um, the materials could help galvanize some action for people who are looking at things that are appropriate for both school aged children and teachers as well. Uh, next slide, please. So childcare facilities require a bit of a different strategy. So for schools, what can really help is with public health people reach out to those working in schools, school districts, and even the Ministry of Education. For childcare facilities, public health is often a little bit closer because of childcare licensing. And we have found that success has been had for getting people to test daycares in particular in British Columbia where in the interior health region, they've actually had a program where radon testing is required to get a childcare facility license. And there's been an environmental health officer that has worked very hard to get this program off the ground. And now at least 80% of the daycares have tested for radon. And then just a reminder that many, many childcare facilities are either on ground contact or in a basement where we know radon levels are, are elevated. So these spaces in particularly are quite vulnerable and supporting this is really gonna go a long way to reducing again, lifetime exposure to risk. So public health is we believe well situated to make changes around radon, particularly in childcare facilities, in part because environmental health officers are already dealing with these spaces for other things such as water or just general safety. Next slide, please. So just to take Sandy up a bit uh, on the 100 test kit challenge and to talk a bit about how public health can get involved in this initiative. So the Take Action on, program, Take Action on Radon program offers communities 100 free test kits. We need a community champion to, to step up and initiate this, but the program provides live educational sessions, resources, materials, promotion and support, online webinars, of course, given COVID. And then once the communities have tested, reports are generated and provided back to both the people who took part as well as the municipality. So these are aggregated, so we don't disclose any personal information. On the right is a picture of the city of Halifax. We had a 100 test kit program. So of course, this was a very small number of people who live in Halifax. It was only 3% of all community dwellings were tested. But what we did find was 37% of homes tested above the guideline. And what we're hoping that this program does in particular is it raises awareness, it gets people testing, it normalizes the concept of testing as being just something that people in your neighborhood do, and it helps people spread the word about how important it is to continue to test. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I think you went backwards. Your way. Thank you. And Sandy brought up the real estate testing program in the Maritimes and in British Columbia, we've also, the Lung Association has been very active within the real estate world and educating the real estate industry in particular. So the Lung Association has worked with others, some in public health to develop course and programming to help educate the real estate industry. And this turned out to be quite important because it wasn't just realtors that we needed to know, but it was real estate boards and the agencies and associations that support real estate really were very much in the dark about what radon was. And BC Lung working with others applied for a standard form committee to put radon on the property disclosure form. And this has had a significant impact on realtors across the province who all suddenly want to know about what radon actually is. So it's uh, interesting to be an experience where people are knocking on your door and, and really asking you for more. Usually we end up having to push radon, but this was a much more of a pull scenario. So now there's new professional standards uh, in British Columbia to raise radon potentially as a latent defect in real estate trans transaction. And we know that other provinces vary in approach, but I think there's a lot to be learned from what's going on in British Columbia, just as the, the Lung Association's work is really showcasing how much impact uh, something with a seemingly small thing can actually be in raising awareness overall. Next slide, please. 
In 2018, I was fortunate to be involved in a policy scan undertaken by the Canadian Environmental Law Association. So I looked at rate on law and policy both in Canada and the best practices that were existing in the EU at the time. And they also came to the conclusion that the, while the federal government has done a lot, they currently have a limited ability to shape how the provinces respond, respond and also in this case, how public health directly responds. And one of the main actions and results of this scan was that we need more provincial level policy, uh, particularly to regulate our built environment and to ensure that we have consistent standards across the country so that everybody is protected from radon in the same way. Next slide, please. One of the key areas that was pulled out of this review um, was inconsistent protection, particularly for vulnerable communities such as renters. So all provinces require that landlords ensure that rental accommodation is safe. This is under general clauses of fitness and repair. And we've seen now that landlord and tenant tribunals in both Ontario and Quebec are actually currently um, assessing cases in which rain on levels would violate standards of fitness and repair. So people are beginning to challenge the idea of having to live in subterranean areas where rain on might be high and having landlords, compelling landlords to deal with this. Alberta has taken a different approach. There have been people in Alberta who have used the Public Health Act to support and pr protect renters. So these are two different strategies, one using landlord tenant tribunals and the other using the Public Health Act. But we are seeing movement in Canada where public health professionals are trying to help protect renters from excessive exposure to radon. And we believe that public health officers can work with housing advocates in particular to help tenants reduce their radon levels. Next slide, please. The CELA policy scan also pointed to radon in the workplace. So in Europe, they actually have clear rules compelling the testing of all workplaces. And in Canada, all provinces have general duty clauses within occupational health and safety in which um, employers are required to provide a safe working environment. Now, Ontario has clearly interpreted this as adopting the norm guidelines. And we know some of the other provinces are as well. And while public health doesn't necessarily always get involved in workplace health and safety issues, public health is also an employer often, and in some cases, such as in Interior Health in BC, people have gone out and tested all the buildings that their workers um, work in. And the federal government has also initiated its federal government testing program to ensure that all the buildings that it employ its employees work in also comply with the federal regulations. So we, we can't forget that people also spend time at work, um, although that's changing. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as Jill had mentioned previously, uh, COVID-19 orders have required many of us to work from home. And while we have calculated exposures to radon, predominantly focusing on residential testing because we've assumed in our calculations that people spend about 70% of their time at home and then 90% of time indoors, of which 20% of that is often construed as being your work time. But if we revisit these calculations, assuming that now the majority of people are spending 90 to 100% of their time at home, and often in, like if you're like me right now, you're in a basement, um, you might be wondering, what your exposure levels could be if this scenario continues. So more time at home during the COVID-19 pandemic is indeed um, shedding a bit more light on what it would be like if we continue to spend more time in our homes, particularly in these lower levels and what the implications are for radon exposure. So Jill is right, it's now an even more important time to test what's in the air around you. Next slide, please. So this is the last of my slides, and I'd like to point to the fact that the National Collaborating Center, we developed a really short video that helps orient public health professionals to the actions that they can take to reduce radon gas. And it is Radon Action Month this month. This video is free. Uh, we're very happy for people to promote it, to put it on their website, to use it on YouTube or whatever social media um, outlets that they have. And, and reducing radon exposure will reduce the burden of lung cancer in Canada. 
And as you've seen, there's many new initiatives all across the country, including Sandy's junk mail promotion, which is, you know, really done. It's not just Sandy's, but it's done a really great job of raising awareness along with initiatives for um, like tackle radon and the, even real estate transactions. But we think more could be done if public health really gets involved. And some regions we know already are. So awareness and education is important. The public health people can apply to have a 100 test kit challenge in the community near them if they believe that finances are one of the reasons that people aren't testing 100 free kits goes a long way and generates a lot of information. We actually have a huge 100 test kit challenge going on right now um, in the Okanagan. It's actually blossomed into many small communities having 100 test kit challenges coordinated by public health and interior health. Uh, enacting radon testing during childcare licensing is a relatively straightforward thing that public health professionals can do. You could support school testing by getting out and talking to people in schools or engaging the Ministry of Education and talking about what they're doing. And we can directly support renters um, and other people for whom um, housing and precarity of housing is uh, particularly challenging. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and I'll turn it back over to Sandy. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Uh, there have been some great questions included already. Uh, I have answered a few, but uh, certainly haven't got a chance to do them all. Uh, so as you can see on the screen, uh, we welcome uh, further contact. Uh, love to see uh, some of you take uh, on our challenge to be, uh, you know, a dot that can be connected to all this and a part of the, uh, the solution. There's, there's a lot of work to be done. So let's get into the questions. Ian, could you help me out a little bit? I sure can, Sandy. Um, so you have answered some of these on, um, uh, on the, in the Q&A module, but maybe uh, we could just uh, quickly recap some of them. So uh, the first question up was, what is the sources of radon at home? Right, and for this, uh, the answer is uh, very simply that it's it's naturally occurring uranium. Uh, it can come from soil or rock beneath the home. Uh, the biggest difference is that uranium is a solid, and as it decays uh, in the radon state, that becomes a gas, which means it's more mobile and will be drawn into the home more readily uh, through what we call a, a vacuum or stack effect. As the hot air rises and escapes on the top of the house, uh, you'll find more radon coming in through uh, openings in the bottom of it. Excellent. Uh, and actually a question I've always had, if, if uh, one house on a street has a high radon level, how, is it, uh, how likely is it that other houses will also have high radon levels? Yeah, wouldn't we all like to know, but please don't try to predict uh, radon. Uh, for a noble gas, it's actually a pretty uh, uh, rude and challenging little bugger. Um, there's just far too many factors to predict. Uh, the only way to know is to test. Great. So current Health Canada guidance recommends testing to be done during the heating season. However, research in Western Canada shows that there's very little variation in radon measurements across seasons. Will the Health Canada guidelines be updated to reflect this research? Right, of course, uh, a very good uh, piece of research. However, only one uh, source. And in fact, they only found that that was true in about half of the homes. Uh, so I don't think you can quite expect uh, an update to the guidance yet, uh, because the reality is that uh, the Gazette says to base your decision on an annual exposure. Uh, that is your risk, 200 becquerels uh, per cubic meter uh, annually. Uh, so, uh, Plenty of uh, good research being done out there, and it's all valuable, uh, but I wouldn't expect an update just based on that alone. Great. So uh, next question, uh, for the 100 test kit program, how many homes that exceeded, exceeded 200 be becquerels, is it, per uh, cubic meter were able to afford mitigation? Right, so uh, I, I had to call a friend for that one. Uh, Turns out that that research is in progress and you can expect that in uh, the spring. Anne-Marie, do you have anything to add to that? 
Oh, just exactly that, that we're actually following up um, with the people who participated to see what it is that they've done and of those who mitigated, what were the factors that facilitated mitigation for them. And there are, there are some programs to help support people to mitigate and we're piloting different initiatives for that. Reducing exposure, testing doesn't actually help you reduce exposure. It's just a first step on a, on a long list of many things that people need to do to actually reduce their radon levels. It's an important step, but mitigating is really where it's the, the key thing to reduce levels. So we are following that trajectory carefully to see how we can better support people to actually mitigate their homes. Excellent. Uh, next question is, uh, does the prevalence of lung cancer vary by province? I can answer that. It's Anne-Marie. Um, the Canadian Cancer Society provides statistics for the cancer rates for each province. So yes, the, the levels, the rates do vary. Um, they often reflect the smoking levels though in each province. And so teasing out the correlation between radon and smoking or radon alone is difficult at this point in time. Um, Jill, I don't know if you had anything else to add to that, but if you are interested, the Canadian Cancer Society's most recent uh, special edition was actually on lung cancer in Canada and the burden, and it drills down into some very specific areas. Thanks, Anne-Marie. I think you covered that perfectly. I couldn't have said it better. Thanks. Very good. Uh, next question is from a health educator in the Oregon Health Authority uh, and was wondering if anyone on your staff uh, was developing or is working on developing multifamily, um, sorry, a multifamily building toolkit for property owners and or building managers. Uh, so I don't know if the important part here is the multifamily or uh, the uh, owner tenant relationship, uh, but I can tell you that there are some fact sheets in the works uh, to uh, discuss the rights of a tenant uh, and options for discussion with their landlord. And that is uh, been long awaited, uh, but definitely uh, coming soon actually. So timely question. Excellent. Uh, why is the use of an exhaust fan important? Right, so uh, an exhaust fan would make the system uh, what we consider to be active. Uh, you can do it passively. Uh, so in that case, uh, it is most likely to succeed if the pipe is able to go all the way straight up to rooftop discharge. Um, in a retrofit situation, this is simply not possible uh, most of the time without disturbing quite a bit of the home. Uh, but research is ongoing to look at that as an option for new construction. It's fairly important that it remain at a, as a four inch pipe, which is actually double uh, the area or volume in this case of a three inch pipe, which is a lot easier to hide in the cavity. But uh, having that fan run consistently will just ensure uh, that you provide that pathway for the gas as opposed to letting natural convection take over. But it is possible to do it both ways. Excellent. Uh, next question is, there were some great uh, setting specific policies or initiative recommendations discussed. Can the slides be shared with participants so that we can revisit these recommendations? It, I think we can share these slides. That's Anne-Marie. I also uh, urge people to review the CELA policy document because there's a lot of really interesting things that people are looking specifically at policies that can be adopted by public health. That, that uh, evidence review between Canada and the EU has some really great nuggets that we weren't even able to discuss within the time frame here. So that's another online easily available from their website resource. Great. So uh, and just to remind participants that a recording of today's webinar will be posted to CPH's YouTube channel and we'll send you a link to that once it is available. Uh, and since the uh, our panelists have uh, agreed to share their slides, we'll include a link to that in the in the video description. So next question is, how are you teaching new immigrants about radon hazard? 
or perhaps Sandy. are you? <laughs> that's a great question. It's a great question. I'm sure Sandy, that's probably in your wheelhouse, I think. Right, so a colleague of mine uh, whose file covers a lot uh, broader range of hazards in the home, uh, they do have uh, a lot more contacts in that respect. Uh, it has not been something that I have uh, been able to do a lot. Uh, however, it is being covered in uh, what used to be called uh, the calm sessions, uh, chemicals, awareness, learning modules. And now I believe they're just calling it healthy homes. So if you're specifically interested in that, I can put you in contact with the right people. I, it's an, it's Anne Marie. I'm heartened to hear people's interest in both multi-unit housing and you know tenants and people coming to Canada. I think historically we've really focused on single detached homes as our primary unit, uh, you know, addressing radon. But recognizing more and more that you know Canadians aren't living in those types of structures, both for financial reasons and city planning reasons. We know that fewer and fewer of this type of housing is being constructed, and so turning our attention to some of these new um, you know, modalities that people are living in is actually really important. Excellent. Uh, so next question is, has there any been any considera consideration to moving Canada to the WHO limit uh, for radon uh, concentration? Anne-Marie, are you holding back? I'm, I'm deferring to you, Sandy, as a Health sure. Canada representative. Sure. Uh, so just a little bit of background. Uh, the WHO recommendation is a range of 100 to 300. Uh, we are smack dab in the middle of that uh, with the caveat that when you do something, you go as low as reasonably achievable. Um, we had to confirm at least that it was possible in our climate um, and a reasonable expectation of of uh, the professionals that we didn't have 13 years ago that they'd be able to get uh, radon levels down to that level. I think we are seeing uh, that it's possible and certainly wouldn't rule it out. Uh, but at this stage, there are simply not enough people taking action um, to, to warrant uh, a change, right? They haven't adopted the first change. We used to be at 800, by the way. The first guideline from 1988 was 800 and then reduced to 200 in 2007. And again, we're still, we're right in the middle of the WHO recommendations. So. Great. If, if I could just add to that, if that's okay, it's Jill. Um, Sandy, very, I, I, you know, I couldn't have said it better. However, I think it's important for people to understand and emphasize the point that even though Health Canada has put an action guideline of 200, all of us will encourage everyone to lower their radon levels as much as they can and as reasonably possible. And there's there's great evidence um, that working with a certified radon mitigation expert can lower your radon levels well over 80%. There was a recent study that showed well into 90% of that. If, if someone has a radon you know, level of 199 versus 201 with an average, their risk really isn't any different. Um, but as well, you know, regardless of when people are receiving their test results, we are really emphasizing that you know, explaining to them if they're above or below that guideline number, but that there's always actions that they can take to further reduce their risk. And, and it's just that it's a risk factor. It doesn't mean that you're safe. So that's part of our education and awareness uh, pieces as well. And some of our messaging is that it's a guideline. It doesn't mean that there's, that you're safe or not safe with that. Excellent. Uh, next question is, how about radon testing in Indigenous homes uh, in the community? I can speak to that, Sandy, if you like, just to start yeah. off with. Um, so in British Columbia, the First Nations Health Authority initiated some research two years ago to look at housing, First Nations housing in particular, and sort of the strategies that can be employed to bring communities together to talk about radon testing. We recognize that, that ha there's housing challenges already for people within First Nations communities. And so I would really point to that research, which is conducted by Mr. Casey Neathway, that really laid out what he felt was a strategy for improving testing in communities in British Columbia. But I believe it's also applicable across the country as well. So I'll stop there, Sandy, feel free, or Jill, 
Thank you, Emery. Uh, public buildings uh, have been tested in most uh, cases uh, on reserve. However, uh, similar to the 100 test kit challenge, it often takes a, a local champion. Uh, it seems uh, there are many uh, examples of success stories across the country in testing uh, homes in Indigenous communities, but it has not uh, been done across the entire country. Great. So we're in our last minute. Um, so we've got two questions. So hopefully we can cover both of these quickly. First one is, if anecdotally speaking with one person on a street that has a recent lung cancer diagnosis and says five more people on their street have also had lung cancer in the past 10 years, would you suggest targeted radon testing on that street? I think everyone Asked. should test. Oh, yes. Yeah, there Sorry. you go, Henry. <laughs> Yeah, go Everyone ahead, should test. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your neighbor's levels are. It doesn't matter if your late your neighbor has been diagnosed or not. Everyone should test. Um, and, and that's really our message. And, and I think that's what Sandy was trying to uh, relay earlier too, is, is there's just too many factors to guess and you know, am I more at risk? Am I not at risk? Everyone needs to test. And then, and then if you're, and Even then if you're, bring your levels down as low as reasonably possible. Testing, like Anne Marie said earlier, is not going to reduce your risk of lung cancer, but it's the first step in in knowing what you're dealing with. And I would just point it. It doesn't have to be a single detached family. Again, the research that I've done in North Vancouver clearly shows that townhouses have elevated levels as long uh, along with single detached housing. So it's it's not just our vision of a neighborhood that's a suburb with houses. It's you know all streets and all types of housing need to be tested. Great. Now our last question is. Is there a specific demographic other than the elderly at higher risk of lung cancer caused by radon, thinking about the determinants of health? Okay. And I'm, yeah, I, I'm happy to say that, you know, anybody who breathes uh -huh. in contaminants is at risk for inhaling things that can contribute to the development of lung cancer. So you know, smoking is one of them. There's a number of other, although often to a lower prevalence inside people's homes, including formaldehyde and 1,3-butadiene and benzene. We know these chemicals do contribute. So workers are another group of people, uranium miners, obviously, but um, there are other groups of people for whom indoor exposures can be particularly high for different reasons. So it really depends on what's in the air around you and whoever has higher concentrations, it doesn't, radon doesn't discriminate um, based on, on any particular group. It's, uh, it's if you can breathe. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you to our participants for their great questions. Obviously a topic of uh, concern uh, for the public health community. And uh, let's hope that we can connect some more dots with today's webinar. Uh, so I wanna thank you again, Jill, Sandy, and Anne-Marie for a tremendous presentation today. Uh, our thanks to Health Canada for their support in uh, making today's webinar possible. And uh, wish you all uh, the very best. Uh, stay well, uh, take care of yourselves, and be kind to each other. Uh, have a great day. Goodbye.